Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. Hello out there, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. Here we are. We have a incredible guest that we want to spend the full hour with and maybe a little bit more. So we are curbing the chit chats from Alexandra and me on this episode. So Alexandra, hello. Hi, Dotsie. Well, let me introduce Dr. Alan Desmond right away. So if you've got gut issues, audience, keep listening because we have a doctor on call. Dr. Alan Desmond is a general practitioner and gastroenterologist based in the UK. He incorporates whole plant-based nutrition to treat your problems, not just the symptoms. And he has seen remarkable results with hundreds of patients. Dr. Desmond is also the author of Plant-Based Diet Revolution, 28 Days to a Happier Gut and a Healthier You. He serves as an ambassador for Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And if you've got tummy troubles, Dr. Alan Desmond is in. Welcome, Alan, to the Switch for Good podcast. Oh, thanks, Alexander. What a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Hi, Dotsy. Lovely to be here with both of you. Looking forward to it. What we'd like to do is start off talking about your book. Um, and so tell us, what was the inspiration for writing The Plant-Based Diet Revolution? The number one inspiration, Alexander, is my patients, um, very much so. As I mean, you alluded to, to it all in your very kind introduction there, but as a gastroenterologist, I mean, I've been a consultant or attending gastroenterologist now for nine years, but the journey to becoming an attending uh, in any specialty or a consultant in any specialty starts a long, long, long time ago. So I went into med school in 95, graduated in 2001. And about 2003, 2004, I'm on my first rotation in gastroenterology. And really, um, it struck me from a very, very early point that every patient would ask about food. But Dr. Desmond, most, at least here, Dotsie, Correct me if I'm wrong, here in the United States, when patients ask their doctors, what about the food? Often the doctors say, uh, um, uh, 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 well, here, take this pill. So yeah. well, that makes you different already right there, right, Dazi? Um, and, and, yes, it does. It makes you so different and it's inspiring and exciting. So, um, you know, one, one question it, that has to do with your book uh, that I just, would love so much if you would share is you, you start the book with a story about uh, the 19 year old patient uh, mm. in the hospital had Crohn's and what his doctor said when he asked about food and what he could eat to help his condition. Will you share that? So one day we're on the ward round. This is the story I tell in the book. We're on the ward round. We've got this young man, he's 19 and he has just come into hospital with Crohn's disease. So a section of his bowel is red and sore and inflamed. He can't eat anything. Three days into his mission, he's been on potent intravenous steroid drugs. And the good news is that they're working. The inflammatory markers are coming down. It looks like he's not going to need surgery. We're going to start another immune suppressing drug in the morning. And we're at the bedside. I'm the junior member. The rest of the teams are my boss. It's like three pay grades above me is talking to the patient. And this young man says, you know, I'm feeling hungry again. Is there anything I should eat, Doc? What about food? And my boss, his attending, his consultant, said to him, it doesn't matter. Eat whatever you like. 
calories are just calories. And right now you need calories. And my boss turned to the young man's mom, who was there to support him, and said, does he like McDonald's, mom? Why don't you bring him into the McDonald's? He needs more calories. Now, that statement reflected the absolute standard thinking at the time in medicine. Calories are just calories regardless of source. The young man was surprised. His mom was surprised. As a very young doctor, Doxy, I, I didn't quite know what to make of it, okay? I hadn't been taught any different. And when I went to the medical journals to get the same quality of evidence, the same strength of evidence from the same journals that would teach me about the latest medication and the medications are fantastic and would teach me about the latest colonoscopic technique or surgical technique and all of those things are wonderful and valuable and needed. But in the same journals, there were articles about the role of food in these conditions, these inflammatory bowel diseases. And I learned that these diseases used to be really rare. And I learned that while you can have a genetic predisposition to these diseases, the genetics do not determine the severity of your disease or the disease course. And that when we look at these diseases emerging in Europe and the US and Australia in the 20th century and into the 21st century, and when we look at these diseases, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis emerging in countries like Japan or Egypt or Mexico in the late 20th and early 21st century, we see that these are diseases these are diseases of high income countries. These are diseases that rise in parallel with type two diabetes and obesity and heart disease and bowel cancer when we westernize or industrialize our diet and lifestyle. And when we move away from the unprocessed plant-based foods that humans have thrived on for millennia, and when we start to embrace highly processed foods and junk food chemicals and dairy and meat. And when all of our calories are coming from those foods, it sets up in terms of our digestive health, our gut microbiome, and in every aspect of the food that you're eating, we are creating the perfect recipe, the perfect recipe for dreadful digestive health. I was um, am in Atlanta right now, and and we had our switch for good tent set up, and we were educating um, a huge uh, soccer tournament. So you know, different athletes would would come by and and learn uh, such and such. And one of the mothers came by, mm -hmm. and um, she was I would say obese, and she said, you know. I have Crohn's, I have IBS, I can't eat anything. She's on the FODMAP diet, she said, but she said, my doctor said to me, you know, if this doesn't work, you might have to try that vegan thing. Mm. And she said, so I'm so excited to see this tent because you know, I had a, lots of information for her and, and I even had some cookbooks that I just gave her so she could oh, good you know, job. dive in. But what would, what would you have said to her? That's not, that, that just in that moment of, what might, cause obviously her doctor didn't really know much about the vegan thing. Cause that, you know, he didn't even say the whole food plant-based thing. He said, you might have to try that vegan thing. What, what would you have said to her uh, in, you know, 30 seconds that, that just might have helped her feel like, ah, oh, I might find some relief if I try that vegan thing, you know, sooner than so, later. So I would have told her that from the day she was diagnosed with this condition, she knew intuitively that food had a role to play, but she has not yet been given the evidence-based answers from her team because they don't know what they are. The news is good. Her intuition is right. Food has a huge role to play. And with the right support, yes, we can help you to unprocess your diet and to eat more plants. And in I, I'm telling you right now that this will improve your prognosis and help your medications to work better. And in the unlikely scenario that it makes zero difference to your digestive health, what have you lost? The side effect profile of this prescription is incredible. We will help you to achieve yes. a healthier body weight. We will help you to reduce your risk of coronary vascular disease. We will help you reduce your risk of, of colorectal cancer. And, you know, as a gastroenterologist, Dotsu, when we see our patients with digestive health, of course, we have got to restore their digestive health. That is our number one goal. But we've got to remember, we're treating a whole human. And if I have a patient like that lady standing in front of me, telling me that she has this uh, chronic inflammatory disease in her bowel, and she's looking for help, 
at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what's the number one cause of premature death in patients like this? It's coronary vascular disease. It's coronary vascular disease. So whatever the prescription is, it's got to tick that box as well. Wait, what? It's cardiovascular disease because, because wait, we're talking about her, her, her. No, nope, for two good reasons. Okay, <laughs> so we, so we know number one that by far and away the number one cause of premature death in the U.S. Uh, the number one cause of death due to all causes is coronary vascular disease. Mm. But we yeah. also know that individuals with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, Crohn's and colitis, actually have a substantially increased risk profile for developing coronary artery disease. So whatever treatment plan you have for your patient with inflammatory bowel disease, it's got to improve their coronary vascular disease. Are you saying that because if they're inflamed in their bowels or their intestines, they're probably inflamed in their arteries and veins? What we suspect is that it's due to them being in a chronic state of inflammation. And if you are in a chronic state of inflammation for any reason, it does promote the atherosclerosis that builds up in cardiovascular disease, for sure. But the data on that is very clear. Huge US studies um, showing that people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are at an elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. So we've, it's just the point being that we can't, Although, yes, restoring your digestive health is important, we're going to achieve more than that. Right. Because, I mean, and I talk about this in the book a lot, all, all health begins in the gut. This, right. isn't, new, this isn't new news. Dotsie, you were very kind, and Alexander, you were very kind to earlier say, well, you're very unusual because you take this approach. But, of course, we have known this for two and a half millennia. Hippocrates of Cos, the, 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 the father of modern medicine, you know, two, two and a half, 2,500 years ago, fifth century BC, was telling his disciples and his followers that all health begins in the gut. Mm -hmm. And when I heard, the first time I heard that, I thought, that, can that be true? Is it true? But we now know that the food that we put into our gut is the number one determinant of health and longevity. The food we consume every day decides whether our body and our gut microbiome thrive and help us to optimize our health or the exact opposite. And that's as relevant to someone with Crohn's as colitis as, or colitis as it is for anybody. Well, what, one of my concerns would be that if she just followed her doctor's prescription of maybe going on that vegan thing, doing that vegan thing after, that she might actually have more problems and then just abandon vegetables altogether. And you do talk about this, how if we do start eating lots of vegetables and beans and fruits and nuts and seeds and grains, whole grains, sometimes our gut doesn't react well. So what do you say to patients who tell you that? Probably have some patients come in and eat like a fairly good, but they add in meat and dairy, but people that are just literally coming off a of fast food diet can't quite handle all that cruciferous and fiber. Oh my goodness, you're absolutely right. And I mean, the standard Western diet is the is the enemy here. This is the this is the dietary approach that means that one in three adults in the U.S. under fifty have diabetes. Things cost the U.S. two and a half billion dollars a year. Why colorectal cancer affects more than one in twenty adults in their lifetime? Why non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is now one of the most common causes of chronic liver disease, affecting up to hundred million people in the United States. Of nearly twenty five percent are at risk of developing cirrhosis. The standard Western diet is why. Gastroesophageal reflux disease affects one in five adults in the US and why antacid medications, which are designed to shut off a really important part of your digestive system, the acid production in your stomach, to kind of put a, a lid on your digestive symptoms, remain one of the most commonly prescribed medications on the planet. Okay. okay? But you're quite right. If you have been eating, like this lady that you mentioned a moment ago, um, or anybody with digestive health problems, and they want to jump in to a plant-based diet, what would I tell them? Okay, a few things. Number one, don't be a junk food vegan, okay? The junk food, the pepperoni pizzas, the non-dairy ice cream, the hot dogs, all these things, okay, they're vegan, they tick a lot of boxes if you're interested in the environment and animal welfare, et cetera, and these are important things. But in terms of your digestive health, they are still junk food. They contain chemicals like maltodextrin and carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbate. These are chemicals that are made in factories and pumped into these foods to make them taste good. They have no business in your digestive system. 
They weaponize your gut microbiome. These foods are fiber free. The good stuff is removed. Unhealthy stuff is added. Saturated fat, salt. You're, ex you're, you're exchanging one problematic food for another problematic food. So number one, don't be a junk food vegan. Number two, focus on the diversity of plants in your diet. And that kind of comes as an opposite to the thing I just said. So if you were focusing on whole plants as you build your plant-based dish, you are maxing out the diversity of fiber. So your digestive system, your gut microbiome, your gut microbes, as you know, guys, they love to get a variety of fiber. We know that getting 30 different plants in your diet is a great initial target. It was a few years ago, the American Gut Project looked at dietary intakes and gut microbial health in a huge sample of 11,000 volunteers in the US, Europe, Australia, elsewhere. And they found that people who were eating more than 30 different plants per week unlocked gut microbial benefits that just weren't seen in other people with fiber loving bacteria that gives so many benefits. We can talk more about that later but focusing on building the diversity. So potato only diet, fruit diet only, no thank you, we want diversity. Next thing, as you're building towards this, make the switch gradually. If you've been consuming the standard American 15 or 18 grams of fiber per day, and now you make the jump up to 55 grams of fiber per day, okay, this is excellent. You will, you're reducing your risk of so many diseases, but it's going to take a little bit of time for your gut microbes, and your gut enzymes to adjust to your new, healthier way of eating. So maybe you'd like to start just by doing breakfasts for a week or two, then maybe move on to lunch for a week or two, then maybe move on to your evening meal for a week or two, and give yourself 28 days or maybe more to gradually build towards your healthier diet. Expect more gas, okay? I, I talk about this a lot, let's try and, can we destigmatize intestinal gas, please? Humans eat, they chew, they burp, they fart, they poo. These are normal digestive things. Your belly that is flat in the morning, even in a healthy person, is going to be a little bit bloated in the evening. That's your digestion working. That's how it works. You might not have that Instagram six pack at 6 p.m., but that's okay. That's okay. It's just gas. It's fine. If it's not causing you pain and discomfort, this is not a bad thing, okay? My good friend Stephen Flynn says if you're having trouble with gas coming out the other end, spend more time outdoors, okay? Get exercise. <laughs> it's normal. It's a normal, it's a normal part of digestion, okay? Yeah. But you're going to notice the gas will increase. But generally, tolerance of, for that um, improves with time. The reason that it improves is because your microbiome changes according to the foods that you eat. Precisely, and gets more efficient at, um, at breaking these down. And when we start eating, the, our gut microbes begin to respond within days, Alexandra, within days. And by 28 days, the beneficial changes are firmly established. And you will experience that in your digestive system as well. But you can hack that by making the change gradually. A few other things I would say to someone is find your own way. Um, you don't have to eat exactly like I have in my book or my recipes or on Instagram. You don't have to eat like your favorite uh, influencer. You don't have to eat like your best friend who eats a vegan diet. You just, if you go on uh, Google right now and Google up healthy vegan recipes, you probably get a hundred million recipes, okay? So find foods that are familiar to you, the change doesn't have to be dramatic. If you're used to chicken pot pie, you got chickpea pot pie. If, you know, so I don't want you to have to turn your whole life on its head to make these changes. And also as you're going forward to make sure those supplements are on point, your B12, your D3, consider plant-based omega-3. Um, being deficient in these things in the long term may contribute to fatigue, core energy, anemia, and digestive symptoms. And your, your friend who you mentioned who you met at the football game um, was told to go on low FODMAP, right? So specifically mm -hmm. for Crohn's and colitis, for any condition, going low FODMAP means you are taking out healthy foods from your diet. Yeah. FODMAPs, the F stands for fermentable, okay? And these are generally healthy foods. A lot of healthy foods are high in FODMAPs. Legumes, beans, tofu, all these foods contain FODMAPs, which our gut microbes begin to digest and ferment, which is a good thing because they generally turn them into short chain fatty acids, which are so beneficial for a digestive health. But if there's too much of that going on, 
Yes, it can cause bloating and discomfort. So anybody that's who goes through the FODMAP process, the reduction in those foods, please make sure that you are working with a dietitian to help you to reintroduce them in a stepwise process, because we want you to restore that plant diversity as time goes by. Yeah. So can we just clarify what FODMAP is? We've talked about them before in our show, but just so people know that they're, that they're in a lot of healthy foods and uh, the, the microbiome just needs to get used to digesting them. And that's, that's yeah. the issue, right? Indeed, they're generally um, small carbohydrates, which we find predominantly in plants. Most of them are really, really good for us. So FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Okay, so they're found in various foods. There's only one FODMAP that I'm happy for people to eliminate. The D in FODMAP stands for disaccharide, and the disaccharide is generally lactose from dairy products. You do not need that to be healthy. Your digestive system does not need that to be healthy. But you also have so many healthy foods that are high in FODMAPs, uh, legumes, tofu, beans, wheat, artichokes, onion, garlic, and they fall into different groups. But there are a few things that even if you've done everything that I just said a few moments ago, and you're still suffering in those initial weeks with some bloating and discomfort, um, if you want to use tofu as your source of bean, it's a soya bean, but because the way it's produced, it's lower in fiber, lower in FODMAPs. Uh, tempeh is uh, fermented beans. So those are pre-fermented. So the fermentation, which generates the gas and liquid, has already been done for you in the production process. So by eating tempeh, you will get less bloating. If you're buying canned beans, make sure you rinse them thoroughly. So get rid of all that fluid that comes in the can with them before you heat them and eat them. If you're cooking your own beans from scratch, really soak them overnight and get rid of that fluid before you cook them. That helps to reduce the gassiness associated with the beans. And my other top tip would be buy pre-cooked and ready to eat legumes because they're usually cooked at high temperatures that helps to reduce the FODMAP content. And then finally, there's a digestive enzyme supplement that I often recommend to people. You can get it in the US as well. If there's two brands, Bean Assist and Beano, um, they have this uh, digestive enzyme called alpha-galactosidase, uh, which helps to break down some of those fermentable carbohydrates before they meet your gut microbiome so you don't get the bloating. And you can buy that for a few dollars, take two before each meal that you suspect is going to make you particularly gassy, and it'll help to put a lid on the gas. Yeah, we've done it. You have done a fantastic job about talking about the things that we need to do for a healthy gut. Uh, one of those things, definitely getting a really wide variety. And that's something that will be told us too. Uh, Angie Sadeghi, um, and I still struggle with, I still go to the grocery store and, you know, you tend to look down and you're like, oh gosh, I know what all these vegetables are. For a while there, I was trying to go buy something every week that I didn't really know how to cook. And I, you know, didn't really necessarily know what to do with it. But um, I, I would love to talk about the things that destroy our microbiome so that we know. Um, obviously, junk food, McDonald's, and I, I'd like to understand a bit more why, but also things that for the vegans that are listening, um, uh, coffee, the acid in coffee, is that something we should be aware of? Alcohol, uh, you know, th things that, you know, we're, we're, we're really diverse vegan diet. Are there, are there other things mm. that, that, that hurt or, or, uh, you know, help to destroy our microbiome that, that we could be in it? Anything that we might be breathing, um, yeah, putting uh, on so our skin? No, you're right. So I haven't seen any evidence to show that coffee specifically will damage your gut microbiome. Alcohol is not your friend when it comes to maintaining excellent digestive health. So for example, when we look at patients with ulcerative colitis, alcohol consumption is a predictor of flares in that disease. When we look at colon cancer, so look, obviously, when you're talking about digestive health, developing a cancer of one of the major parts of your digestive system is a real good marker of poor digestive health, right? And we know that alcohol is a, is a risk factor for developing colon cancer as well. So alcohol, certainly something that we need to avoid. The, the data on things like, you know, occupational exposures, chemicals, sprays, um, et cetera, that you may come across in the environment. I haven't seen convincing data on any of these, Dotsie. I haven't even seen convincing data 
on uh, non-organic foods or GMOs or sprayed uh, crops having a negative impact directly on the human gut microbiome. There is a lot of mechanistic possibilities, but actually seeing the data, I haven't seen it yet. But, you know, as my good friend Bob Andrews reminds me when it comes to talking about organic versus non-organic food, I mean, I'm a big gut microbiome fan, but he always reminds me, the soil has a microbiome too, Alan, you know, and that's where our gut microbiome comes from. Maybe rather than giving you a list of things to avoid to build good digestive health and a really healthy gut microbiome, why don't I give you a few things you can do every day to do the opposite and build a healthy and diverse gut microbiome. So we already talked about building in the diversity of plants and don't be too hard on yourself, Dotsy, if you're going to the supermarket and not buying exotic fruits and vegetables, because we already know that by eating a whole food plant-based diet, you are going to be eating a great variety of um, fiber already, probably much more than your neighbors and the other people at the supermarket. And we also know that people who eat plant-based have a healthier gut microbiome than omnivores. So you're already winning. I'm sure you're already winning. But so that's number one, okay? The diverse plant-based diet. Number two, spending time outdoors and in natural environments. We forget about this, okay? A human's natural environment isn't a room like this or the rooms or the hotel room or wherever you're sitting right now. It's nature, it's beaches, it's mountains, it's woodlands, it's the ocean, it's the beach. These, this is where humans evolved, okay? Our gut microbiome, our gut microbes, the archaea, the yeasts, the viruses, the bacteria that live in our digestive system, live in a perfect symbiosis with us, but they come from the natural environment. By spending time in natural environments, we can help to improve the health and diversity of our gut microbiome. And the studies on that are convincing. So we've got our diverse plant-based diet, We've got spending time in nature, exercise, physical exercise, great studies, some done by my alma mater, University College Cork and Microbiome Ireland, showing us that athletes, independent of diet and other factors, tend to have a more diverse and healthy gut microbiome and tend to have more of the fiber-loving bacteria within their digestive system. And this may be because exercising induces a little bit of stress and then your gut microbiome responds to that stress and begins to repair. And therefore you have more oh, cool. of these healthy bacteria within your digestive system. Um, next thing, avoiding unnecessary medications. Antibiotics in particular. Now, a lot of people freak out when they're given a course of antibiotics that it's going to, you know, I get, de I get messages all the time from people saying, oh my God, I've just had a course of antibiotics. It's going to devastate my gut microbiome. I've been doing all this. I've been, you know, eating a healthy diet for years and now oh, I'm, de I'm devastated. But don't worry, it's not as bad as you think. Yes, certain bacteria can dramatically reduce um, your gut microbial diversity in certain populations within your digestive system within days, However, for the vast majority of people, your gut microbes begin to build back really quickly. Within days and within months, they will be right back to where you started in the majority of cases. In fact, there's some antibiotics like amoxicillin and trimethoprim that don't seem to affect the gut microbiome at all. So if you have had a course of antibiotics, focus on all the other things that we've spoken about. And the final one, I would say, the thing you can do, the final hack, to maintain a healthy gut microbiome is sleep. So important. Mm. So humans function on a 24 hour circadian rhythm. Interestingly, our gut microbes seem to function on the same 24 hour circadian rhythm. In fact, some researchers think that our, our gut microbes help to set our body clock and help to set that 24 hour clock. And we know that sleep deprivation, uh, jet lag, shift working have negative impacts on our gut microbial diversity and health. So by dialing in, getting a good sleep habit and getting those six or eight hours uh, as often as you can, you can also help to maintain your gut health and your gut microbial health. So those are things you can think about on a day-to-day -day basis um, in terms of protecting your digestive health. I heard that having a pet can improve your microbiome and also not being too clean. Two things I advocate for, actually. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're, and, all, and these, all these things during the, the pandemic that we were, the Purell and all that stuff. I, I'm curious if it, what it did to our microbiomes, actually. 
Yeah, in the, well, we we already know, Alexander, that individuals who live in industrialized environments, who spend their time in cars and offices and buildings, compared to people who live in natural rural environments, have a less diverse gut microbiome. And in fact, that diver that loss of diversity then becomes generational, because not only are all the things that I just spoke about important in terms of your gut microbiome, also the people you spend time with on a day to day basis, and the number of people that you spend time with on a day to day basis, and maybe some of those people might be dogs. And we do know that, you know, for children who have pets in the house, um, they have a more diverse gut microbiome than children who don't have pets. And we know that for adults who have dogs, they share some of their gut microbes with their pet dogs. Um, so there you go. It's, more, it's about the people and animals that you share your space with. So when, when we were researching you, we went down the rabbit hole about fiber and intestines and all that stuff and constipation came up. A lot of people deal with constipation. In fact, mm. Uh, and I heard Dr. Will B talk about the fact that, okay, this is what he said. Tell me what you think. When someone's constipated, a lot of times they'll think, I need to get more fiber. But mm. the, when you're constipated, you often get gassy and methane gas tends to slow your bowels. So when you put mm. fiber in, all you get is a bowel that's not moving with more fiber. And that he recommends, uh, Put, he gives his uh, patients a, a big dose of magnesium to move everything through and then comes the fiber and the all the good diet etc cetera, etc cetera. how do you deal with constipation because i think people yeah. and, he, and he doesn't recommend senna or you know all those natural herbs that will move your bowels mm. so this is my mom too so talk to my oh, mom really? constipation and pain and painful Painful constipation. Yeah. So, so in patients who are profoundly constipated and are, are in that situation, and, and just like Will, I'll do the work. If I'll do the blood tests and the stool samples and the scans and the colonoscopies and make sure that, you know, that there's any underlying problem here. But if we suspect that it is simply a dietary deficiency, then I spoke earlier about how when you make that switch to healthier eating, you can develop bloating and discomfort, etc. And for some people, that can be a real issue because they have been over fermenting because they've had this incredibly slow digestive system for decades. So, yes, just like will in cases, I mean, you know, we will see patients at clinic who might have, might have a bowel movement every seven or eight or nine days. I mean, by the time you get to the specialist clinic, often you're dealing with people who are at the more extreme end of poor health. So in those cases, yeah, for sure, just like Will, I will often um, introduce a laxative. And the, the choice of laxative that I take will often depend on the individual patient and where, where they are, where they're starting, what their dietary intakes look like at the moment, what other medications they may be on. Sometimes people are on a lot of painkillers for various reasons that can be very constipating. So sometimes we may, we, we may need to address reducing painkillers if we can. But yes, I will often use magnesium. And yes, I sometimes use things like sodium docosate and senna and some other remedies. Um, but always this comes with a lot of healthy dietary advice. But yes, for people who are very profoundly constipated one you know there's always there is often a role for medication as well and you know uh, even when i'm dealing with crohn's colitis or any other condition i view healthy dietary advice as just one more incredibly powerful tool perhaps the most powerful tool we have in the box but just one more tool and yes we do get out the prescription pad and we do prescribe medications quite regularly um, but we know we can improve the prognosis a lot with the dietary side as well. But yeah, very similar approach in my practice if I have someone who is profoundly constipated. If I'm dealing with someone who, is, who isn't so profoundly unwell and who isn't getting a lot of bloating and distension, I will just send them away with some healthy recipes. But if you gotta think about the person's starting point as well, just bear in mind that we live in food environments where, so in the US, people are eating like 100 kilos of meat per person per year. They're getting, I mean, you'll have a better number on this, but I think it's about 12% of the calories are coming from dairy, about 50 to 60% of the calories are coming from ultra processed junk foods. Whole plants make up about 9% of all calories consumed. Most of the plants that are consumed are wheat, rice, and corn. That's most of the plants that are consumed in the 21st century. And they're usually consumed in a highly processed, fiber deficient, processed food form. 
We spoke earlier about the benefits of consuming more than 30 different plants per week. So many a healthy whole food plant-based diet would be eating 50, 60, 70 different plants a week, easy, without even counting. The same study that revealed that 30 different plants a week is like a golden number also revealed that fewer than one in 250 people are eating that number. Okay, so the, the dietary intakes that we're dealing with right now are terrible, which is why digestive health is terrible, which is why gastroenterologists are so busy all the time. Okay, but so often when I'm speaking to my patients in clinic, in my general clinic about making healthy dietary changes, and I talk about this in the book, we start with, we, st we have to start really basic because often no one has ever spoken to these people about food before. The only education they've had about food has been miseducation that they've received from advertising, that they've received from the meat and dairy industry coming into their primary schools when they were kids and selling them milk and telling them that milk will give them healthy bones. I mean, this may be the only education they've had about food in their lifetime. So, all, so every single patient, every new patient, I'll start really basically. How many pieces of fruit do you eat every day? Sometimes it's none. It's very often none. Sometimes it's one or two. How many times a day do you eat vegetables? And how many different vegetables do you eat every day? Often it's none, guys. Often it's none. Often people say, yeah, I really like vegetables. I have peas with my dinner on Sunday. Okay, right. that, that's often the answer. And then I will say, well, do you eat whole grains every day? And if you do, how many servings do you have? And because people have never been told what a whole grain is, often the answer is, what's a whole grain? Mm -hmm. Is it the bread with the seeds on the top? People don't know this stuff. And so often, I mean, you are starting at very basic points. So often when I'm dealing with people, for example, we entered this conversation on constipation, right? Often I will be saying to that patient, look, I can give you a prescription for a fiber supplement, like an a insoluble fiber supplement or a soluble fiber supplement or magnesium or senna. I can, I can write you a prescription right now. Or... Could you eat three pieces of fruit every day until you come back and see me? Mm -hmm. Or could you have oats for breakfast and swap out pasta for whole grain pasta every day and then come back and see me? So mm -hmm. often these little tweaks that we're making are gradual, you know, and even on my clinic website, I have a green smoothie recipe. I have a high fiber green smoothie for people who don't feel like they could eat three pieces of fruit per day because they've never done that. And now they're 50 yeah. and they've got half a century of standard Western diet that we're going to try yeah. and reverse. So, so it's very much about meeting people where they are. What do yeah. you think about Metamucil and those fibers that people can buy in the store? Uh, in, yeah, in they, the pharmacy they, they, aisle. Yeah, they 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 may have a place while we're starting out on this change. Um, but really, I find when I give my, my patients the option of making some simple dietary changes, and I don't say, look, here's my book, you gotta go whole food plant based. For many patients, that's the conversation we're having. And I think in most cases, people will rather have an apple, a banana, and a kiwi fruit every day than take Metamucil or another prescription. Um, so that's where I spend most of my time talking with my patients about fiber, talking about whole plants. Yeah. I'd love to talk about cravings. Um, we, we crave what we eat. And one of the main things that I noticed when I went whole food plant-based is my, my, my sweet tooth started dying out um, as I was just eating a lot less, well, processed sugar for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, when I switched over, but I've always wondered what is a craving? Like, where does that come from? And if we stop eating a certain food, is it our, 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 our microbes in our gut who eat that food? Do they message our brain to well, crave I'm, the food? So we'll start eating it again. Like if I, I'll, I'll notice if I don't have like a really good, if I'm traveling, and I don't get that salad that I make that has, you know, a million seeds and nuts and beans and, you know, crazy stuff in it. Uh, then I really start craving it. And I've always, I don't, I've always been curious, like, where is that coming from? Well, of course, I mean, 
beyond the gut microbiome, of course, you know, like all these snack foods and sweet foods and oily foods, these are all, you know, engineered to kind of take advantage of our primitive drive to consume high calorie foods. So human beings evolved incredible food shortages and incredible difficulties. So at a very basic level, we are still programmed to crave, seek out and enjoy and feel rewarded when we consume something that's sugary, soy, salty, yeah. oily, et cetera, okay? So the snack foods are built to hit that and give us that little dopamine spike because our body is rewarding us for eating this calorie dense food because at a very basic level, our body knows that the time of scarcity is coming. Yeah, but so that's mostly never, brain chemistry. That's mostly brain chemistry, but of course that yeah. time of Scarcity never comes, okay? It's, it, or, or, but it never comes. So scarcity is never coming, but our brain thinks it is. So when we eat a high calorie food, our body says, well done, great. You are going to survive to long enough to procreate and pass on your genes and the tribe will survive. Good yeah. job. But of course, we've moved way beyond that in the 21st century, but our little primitive brain is still thinking like that. There's been some studies, kind of interesting studies, showing how our gut microbes and our gut microbiome might influence our behavior and our happiness and our food choices. Because our gut microbes aren't just sitting there, they're producing postbiotic chemicals all the time. And you asked me earlier about why that's important. We can talk about that later if you like. But our gut microbes both produce and respond to neurologically active hormones like serotonin, dopamine, and GABA, and nor nor norepinephrine. So when we change the foods we eat, our gut microbes begin to produce different chemicals, including different neural hormones, which can enter our circulation and alter our happiness and our mood and our affect. Now, I've got to say that I haven't seen many convincing studies demonstrating that in humans. You know, like I haven't seen a study showing we fed the person, the human this, we produced these bacteria, those produce this chemical, and now these patients are happier and feeling better. So I haven't seen A to B to C to D, but my goodness, there's so many reasons why when you made the switch to a whole food plant-based diet, that your mood improved and your happiness improved and that you didn't need the junk food chemicals to get that dopamine hit anymore because you were already feeling better and happier from the food choices you were making. Now, in the, in the book, I talk about this, I call it the happiness effect. And I've been very lucky through my clinical practice, through public speaking, through running challenges and online courses. Over the years, I've literally helped thousands of people to make the change to the whole food plant-based diet. And whatever reason, Alexandra and Dotsie, that I asked them to do this or that they have decided to do it, maybe they're doing it to lose weight, control their blood pressure. Maybe they're doing it to reduce the impact in their, on the environment or to reduce the risk of a future zoonotic pandemic. When you check in with them after six weeks or so, you say, oh, so how, how are you getting on? They don't say, oh, my blood pressure is better. My cholesterol is down 28%, which it might be. What they say is, oh, you know, I feel great. I feel happier. I feel lighter. A friend of mine who's a chef who'd been eating kind of a, uh, kind of a paleo style diet for a long time, made the switch to a whole food plant-based diet. And I checked in with him and said, you know, I'm being nicer to people. <laughs> I'm just being nicer to people. So when you take the animal foods out, you're reducing your consumption of products like advanced glycation end products and arachidonic acid, which are found in animal products predominantly, and they're linked to causing chronic inflammation and depression. You're increasing your intake of antioxidants, which has the opposite effect, okay? Eating a whole carbohydrate heavier diet like we do on a healthy whole food plant-based diet, we get all those whole grains and fruits and vegetables also favorably affects the way our body handles a chemical called tryptophan. So there's more tryptophan in circulation and your brain uses tryptophan to make the happy hormone serotonin. So this is the brain chemical that people are prescribed Prozac to boost, okay? So you can naturally boost your levels of serotonin. And when we look at the observational studies, we see that yes, higher intake of fruits and vegetables is associated with higher levels of optimism, reduced feelings of stress, 
helps to protect, protect against depressive symptoms. And we've seen studies done where they simply asked people to eat more fruits and vegetables, did nothing else. And the people right. got happier, having very significant positive effects on their mental health outlook and feelings of stress. Mm -hmm. So for all of those reasons, when I ask people, how are you doing on your plant-based diet? They say, I feel lighter. I feel, mm -hmm. I, I feel more positive, you know, and maybe therefore that's also helping them to go less for the junk food and make those unhealthy choices. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that in our conversation, the words prebiotic and probiotic have not come up. And Dotsie and I know that the science has changed, the recommendations have changed in terms of taking prebiotic or probiotic supplements. And can you talk a little bit about that area? Yes, so probiotics are, I mean, we, we now recognize that our gut microbiome is a control center for human biology, okay? It's really, really important, it's really crucial. Our gut microbes live in perfect symbiosis with our human bodies. It seems like when we look at the science, they want us to be healthier. We want them to be healthier, okay? So we're all rowing the same direction, okay? Now, we spoke earlier about how our gut microbes have been around with humans since the dawn of human evolution, okay? So when the very first cell, human cell, appeared on planet Earth, the little cell that would give rise to the entire human civilization, every human that ever lived, okay? That first moment when that cell evolved on planet Earth, it was part of the planet's microbiome. It was surrounded by bacteria and viruses and other primitive organisms that have been around for two, two to four billion years, okay? Bear with me. This is relevant to probiotics, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> stick with, stick promise. with me, Alex. Okay. Stick with me, Alex. So, so, that, so that's 7 million years ago, okay? 200,000 years ago, modern humans, as we exist now, pretty much appear on Earth, okay? We are still carrying those primitive microbiome bugs that we grew out of with us in our digestive system the yeast, the viruses, the bacteria, the archaea, they have a real and meaningful role to play in our health. They help our immune system to develop, our gut to develop, our, our bodies to develop. Every single day when we eat, we determine how they interact with our body and our immune system. Seven million years of history. We have millions of years of history with our gut microbes. We are old friends. But somehow in the last 15 years, the probiotic industry convinced us that we need to spend $60 billion a year buying their products in order to maintain a healthy gut microbiome. It's nonsense. How could that be true? How could that be true? Okay, so probiotic supplements, powders, yogurts that have live bacteria added to them. Um, I, I don't wanna name any brands, but I will if you want me to. Send a lot of advertising my way to dietitians, to health coaches, to anybody in the health system. They have posters on buses, you know, your simple daily fix, mostly dairy yogurt, often uh, dry powders, capsules, uh, shakes. They come in all, in, in all sorts mm -hmm. of preparations. But look, when you look at the studies, guys, on the effect that those probiotic supplements, which in theory, you're taking some healthy bacteria, you put them in a powder, you're drinking them, okay? So the studies that they do to convince us that this is gonna help our digestive health, they have to work really hard to show any kind of benefit, any kind of benefit. I mean, most of the studies show that the live bacteria that you take don't survive. You, you can't find them in the gut microbiome when you go looking for them. So then the company started telling us, oh, don't worry about that. They just pass through. They exert a bystander effect. It's magic. That's how they work, okay? But last year, the American Gastroenterology Association reviewed all the evidence on probiotic supplements and came down very clearly that if you are a gastroenterologist and you are prescribing a probiotic to somebody for their digestive health, then you should only really do it if you're in a study protocol that is designed to figure out if that probiotic works. There's some very, very niche areas within gastroenterology that aren't relevant to 999 people out of a thousand where we sometimes still use probiotics. But even so, the, expect the expectation of benefit is very low 
and the cost to the patient can be very high. So maybe if even if you'd spoken to me three or four years ago, I might have prescribed them sometimes. Yeah. But the the evidence, and I'm a huge gut microbe fan. I mean, I've been I, I was you know uh, even as a medical student, I was very lucky to work at University College Cork, which had one of the world's leading gut microbiome research institutes, where I went on to work for a few years as a postgrad. So I'm a big microbiome fan, but pr- I'm not a probiotic fan. Uh, and what about a pre? What about prebiotics? So by, taking, so by taking a prebiotic, you're just taking isolated fibers that have been either um, manufactured or isolated from plants and you're taking them. So it's, it's sort of like taking, uh, you're talking about Metamucil and fiber supplements earlier. So you're just taking fiber isolates that are designed to feed the healthy gut microbes within your digestive system mm. to produce more of the fiber loving bacteria that will then produce more of the beneficial compounds that you get when you eat a healthy whole food plant-based diet, but you're, you're, taking, you're taking that one component of the plant that benefits the gut microbiome and taking that in a concentrated form. I would rather you took the whole food approach. You love carbohydrates. I love carbohydrates. Alexandra loves carbohydrates. I absolutely understand uh, how critical glycogen is as an athlete, right? For both sprint and endurance exercise, uh, for sure. I get, and I think so much of our audience does, the difference between highly processed carbohydrates and whole food carbohydrates, you know, the difference between a lollipop and a lingonberry or a donut and a sweet potato, you know, just, yeah. just complete opposite ends of the spectrum. But, but, but share with us and our audience, if there's any out there that are still a little carbohydrate phobic, what are the other incredible multitude of benefits of whole food carbohydrates for our body and our gut, of course. Wow. That's a, Big question. In fact, in my book, I have um, 10 prescriptions for better health, right? So doctor's orders, 10 prescriptions. And two of the prescriptions are specifically um, about eating more carbohydrates. Okay, so let's talk about whole grains. So whole grains, oats, um, whole grain wheat, whole grain pasta, whole grain rice, People have been scared away from those foods, right? But the prescription number three in my book is eat whole grains every day. Why? Because all the science tells us that eating whole grains, unprocessed, high carbohydrate plants increases your personal chances of a longer and healthier life. A few years ago, there was a huge review, a huge scientific review, where they tried to pull together all of the evidence on the benefits or otherwise of whole grain intake to see, are whole grains really good for us? And in the book, I give this quote straight from that scientific paper, whole grain intake, here's the quote, is associated with reduced risk of coronary heart disease, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, and total cancer, and death from all causes, respiratory diseases, infectious diseases, diabetes, and all non-cardiovascular, non-cancer causes of death. Now, that's a pretty comprehensive endorsement, basically. It's like whatever illness you're worried about, eating whole grains every day is going to reduce your risk of getting that illness pretty much. So there, if, I mean, I don't like the superfood label, but I think we can apply it to whole brains, you know? Yeah, it's really important and fascinating. The difference is we've also learned from the cardiologists on our show that one of the number one causes that plays into heart disease is very, very refined carbohydrates. And that's mm. why people get so confused, right? They're literally incredibly protective in their whole form and they can be quite dangerous in their highly processed donut form. Right. Let's say, it's like you said it. earlier, it's like, it's like there's been an apple and an apple pop tart. Okay. So these are not the same thing. They're, they're completely different. And it's not just about whole grains, of course. Um, but we've got also the beneficial carbohydrates Um, that we find in bananas and strawberries and apples and potatoes and all of these foods, which are incredibly beneficial foods. And one of the biggest mistakes I see with people who are making the transition to a healthy whole food plant-based diet for whatever reason is that the carb phobia has been so beaten into them that they are trying to combine whole food plant-based with low carb. 
And what does it do generally? It leaves them feeling hungry and lethargic. Yes. And they feel, oh, this isn't for me. My energy levels are down. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't walk up the stairs. Never, never mind. Get on the bike, you know. Um, so when we look at the healthiest populations in the world, um, we see that they are getting anywhere up to seventy-five or eighty percent of their calories from whole, unprocessed carbohydrates. Wow. I was doing research on dairy and. Um, the the gut because the dairy industry and, and I went to a site that was I think dairynutrition.com or something they straight out said that dairy helps um, protects from bowel cancer and other issues of the uh, of the uh, digestive system bust that myth I will bust that myth should we well first of all as I went on as a gastroenterologist and began talking to my patients more confidently about food. One of the first things, Alexander, that I spoke to my patients about was quitting dairy. Okay. And one of the first food based resources I ever wrote was a website article blog, if you want, on help on how to go dairy free, because I recommended dairy free to my patients with like significant digestive symptoms all the time either as a long-term treatment or as a temporary change while they're awaiting the results of various important tests. And when it comes to gut health, dairy is scary, okay? Dairy are rich in lactose, a simple sugar called lactose. Whatever the dairygothealth.com website said there that you mentioned, let's, let's remember that 75% of the people on the planet cannot consume dairy. They cannot consume milk. And for them, in a very real way, dairy isn't doing their digestive health any favors at all, because from about the age of two, their small intestines stopped expressing the enzyme lactase. So they stopped being able to break down the lactose sugar in the dairy into galactose and lactose so it could be absorbed, which is really important for little babies because they need all that carbohydrate to grow their brains and get bigger and grow strong. But for an adult, we don't need it anymore. So 100% of the non-human mammals on the planet become completely lactose intolerant once they're off the breast, okay? There's a subset of human mammals who remain lactose tolerant and they make up about two thirds of the US population, but only about one third of the global population. So that's why dairy in the kind of Eurocentric or American, European, Australian, um, uh, I mean, you guys know all this, your listeners know all this. I, I don't need to, to reinvent the wheel. But for those people, dairy will never help their digestive systems, okay? But so lactose intolerance isn't just an issue for um, people who may be minorities in the US or the UK elsewhere. Lactose intolerance can develop at any age. Um, most people will eventually become lactose intolerant, even if they've been tolerant in early adulthood by the age of about 20 or 40. As we get older, that, that persistent lactate, lactase continues to die off slowly. And so many of my patients who have bloating and abdominal distension and loose stools find that quitting dairy is very beneficial. In fact, studies have shown that about 40 percent of patients with irritable bowel syndrome identify dairy food as a trigger for their symptoms. And more than 50% have a degree of lactose intolerance. People are still scared to quit dairy. I see this in my clinic all the time. When I ask patients about food, they say, yeah, if I have cow's milk, I feel really bloated and gassy. Next question, have you tried stopping it? Like, but don't you need to drink it for it to be healthy? You know, like the, the, the confusion out there is, is beyond belief, right? But we've seen several studies showing that if you have patients with irritable bowel syndrome, going dairy-free can be very beneficial. And it may not just be the lactose. It may also be other components like um, mm -hmm. the casein can trigger IBS symptoms. So that's irritable bowel syndrome. I talked earlier about inflammatory bowel disease, so ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So a very high proportion of people with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease have lactose intolerance. And a six-week trial of going dairy-free, 100% dairy-free, is always worth doing if you have colitis or Crohn's disease. In fact, back in the 1960s, when this, uh, these conditions were becoming more prevalent um, after World War II, as our food system changed, 
Um, some of the most renowned, still very well-regarded experts who described these diseases, like Sidney Trulove of Oxford University here in the UK, they wrote papers, and there was a whole literature at that time about getting your patients with inflammatory bowel disease to switch to a dairy-free diet. And one of the first peer-reviewed journal articles written about um, ulcerative colitis in the UK was a was a, was an article by Sidney Trulove, you know, who's still you know regarded as a as a pioneer in the diagnosis and treatment of inflammatory bowel disease, describing how he had patients with ulcerative colitis and he could switch on and off the disease by getting them to omit dairy or include dairy. And even now in the 21st century, the dairy-free diet is recognised by the European Crohn's and Colitis Organisation as a useful adjunct to treatment for patients with ulcerative colitis. Now, when it comes to bowel cancer, um, there are certain foods that help to substantially reduce your risk of developing bowel cancer. They are fruits, vegetables, legumes, beans, and soya, and whole grains, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a dose response curve. The more of those foods you eat, the lower your risk of cancer, okay? Okay, but there, does, because dairynutrition.ca says, Consuming dairy products reduces the risk of colorectal cancer, including in the United States. milk and cheese. <laughs> yep. So and, there's and a they, they think it might be because of the calcium, or is that there, true? The, is it yeah, just there, there was a huge meta-analysis published on this last year. So meta-analysis is when we get all the data and we put it into one giant research paper, and then we look at it. And it's true. If you look at data from countries where people eat a standard Western diet with tons of meat and tons of dairy and hardly any healthy sources of calcium, then yes, you will get a statistical message in there that milk consumption, and it, the, the, the meta-analysis tells us it's only milk, it's not yogurt, it's not cheese, it's not anything else, it's only milk consumption has been shown by meta-analyses to be linked to lower rates of colon cancer in the US and Europe elsewhere. but we know that this is because of the calcium consumption, because the calcium consumption helps to counteract some of the harmful mechanisms that are initiated by the standard Western diet. So if you are eating a standard Western diet and you are not eating healthy sources of food full stop, and you're not getting healthy sources of calcium, like tofu and beans and nuts, and these foods barely even figure in the US, diet right now. Mm -hmm. So you are not going to see the benefit of those foods in US data. What you'll see is that people are getting their calcium from dairy, therefore their risk is reduced. We know that getting even more than 500 milligrams of calcium per day, we saw this in the nurses health study years ago, does reduce your risk of bowel cancer. However, the World Cancer Research Fund, which is a huge international collaborative effort, WCORF.org, who look at diet and lifestyle and cancer risk, the, they identify and they acknowledge those studies, but then on their patient information leaflet, they make a very clear statement. We recognize this, but because of concerns around other cancers, we make no recommendation on dairy. And that is the approach I take with my patients. I would rather they didn't drink milk to reduce the risk of colorectal cancer because it will help to increase their risk of prostate cancer and certain female cancers. And that's the expert opinion. That's the non-dairy industry opinion. I would rather you increase your calcium intake while increasing your fiber and bean intake and leafy green intake, because now you're getting a quadruple hit in terms of reducing your colorectal yeah. cancer risk. Yeah. I think that's the, 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 the issue that is really important to be clear with people is dairy has some phenomenal nutrients. It is made to grow a baby, just like all mammals, breast milk, right? It's got protein, carbohydrates. It's got some fats. It's got magnesium and calcium and potassium. It's, it's got it is a litany of wonderful things, but none of those things are exclusive to dairy. So you could get all of them from plants and it comes with a suitcase of shit that hurts us. And that's the, that's the difference, right? You've got the degalactose and you've got the lactose and you've got the saturated fat, you've got the trans fats and the list kind of goes on. So shit, yeah, you need calcium, sorry, mm. but 
there are so many other sources that don't come with the suitcase or the baggage that is connected to so many diseases that we've talked about today. Oh my goodness, of course, you said it so, you, you, you've summed it up so well. And I mean, the dairy industry has done an incredible job over the last half a century or more equating calcium yeah. and dairy and bone health. So for most people, those three words are almost synonymous. If you ask someone what's important for your bones, they'll say milk or calcium, calcium or milk. That, that in their mind, these things have become absolutely synonymous. I mean, I talked earlier about how people are miseducated about food. I mean, I remember as a little boy in primary school, there was this lovely lady, we called her Mary from the dairy, and there was Mike the milkman, and they would come into our school and they would, you know, they would they'd bring athletes in and sports people would come into our school with full access to these impressionable children and say, good job, kids, you're drinking your milk, you'll get strong bones. There's no evidence to support that. It's marketing. We know this. Yeah. The, the data doesn't support those claims that are drilled into us as children. You know, I had a young woman come to see me at clinic last year. Um, she was in her early 20s. She was a student. And if she consumed milk, she had bloating and diarrhea. If she didn't consume milk, she was absolutely fine. She came to my clinic with her mom, and you could tell the dynamic was she didn't want to be there, okay? She didn't think she had a problem, but she was there to satisfy her mom, okay? She'd had a bunch of tests. She'd had blood tests. Her GP wanted, had referred her to me to consider whether I would do a colonoscopy on this young woman. And I just sat there with her and said, so just to get this straight, you don't consume dairy anymore. She's like, correct. And all your blood tests are fine. Correct. And you feel well. Absolutely. And you're healthy. And you've got no digestive health problems. Correct. But if you do consume dairy milk, you get bloating and diarrhea. Correct. I said, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah, you're actually human. <laughs> You're, you're, actually actually a healthy, you're actually a healthy human who shouldn't be uh, uh, consuming uh, milk. Exactly, but, but because her mom has been miseducated yeah. throughout her life, I'm not blaming her mom at all. This is the culture we're in. Her mom thought that her, her young daughter had a disease. Yeah. I want to ask about GERD and acid reflux before we go, because I think a lot of people deal with this. I'm not mm. that familiar with it, but I hear about it all the time. Uh, can you tell us if there's a dietary fix for acid? There, there is. I mean, you know, the things that I speak to my patients about with acid reflux, just a few quick ones would be number one, reducing the fat in your diet. Okay. The standard Western diet is a very high fat diet. Um, you can get a lot of fat on a healthier diet too. You can even on a healthy whole food plant-based diet, you can use a lot of oils. I mean, I'm not against oils. I, I, I don't have a, a dogmatic approach to that. I think um, in my cookbook, we use a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. I think that's a beneficial, healthy thing to have in your diet in small quantities. Um, but if I have someone who's struggling with acid reflux, I will ask them to reduce the fat in their diet and go low oil for a period of time to see how well they respond to that. Because when we consume oilier foods, it slows our gastric emptying, Alexandra. So when you eat food, it sits in your stomach. The first part of digestion is where it sits just there in your stomach for a while. The solid food needs to get broken down. The fats need to get emulsified. And it's only when your stomach has turned whatever you've just eaten into kind of a watery sludge that it will then pass through to the rest of your digestive system into the small bowel where all the nutrients begin to get absorbed. So if you're eating higher fat meals, the food is going to sit there longer. Therefore, mechanically, there's going to be more food to reflux and regurgitate. You're going to feel fuller and more uncomfortable. That's number one. Number two, increasing the dietary fiber can help to promote gastric emptying. Um, so moving more to a whole food plant-based diet ticks a lot of boxes, like so many things for digestive health. Smaller meals more frequently. So rather than having three main meals a day, or some people might have like one huge meal a day, I ask people, look, could you break it up? Could you do four meals per day just so we're not overfilling the stomach and having a little glass of water with your meal? Not too much, just a little bit to lubricate things because liquid meals pass through the system more quickly. And then not eating for maybe two hours before you go to bed, sometimes elevating the head of the bed because people reflux get a lot of symptoms during the nighttime. 
So then they wake up in the morning, everything's red and sore and inflamed, right? So elevating the head of the bed can be very helpful. And there, I mean, there has been some, has been some nice work done on this. Um, some people who have acid reflux don't get that typical heartburn feeling. They get um, LPS, they get kind of throat symptoms and nasal symptoms. And there's a nice study done a few years ago looking at that and suggested that adopting a healthy whole food plant centric diet can be as beneficial in reducing symptoms mm -hmm. as can medications like proton pump inhibitors. Um, so if you have been prescribed proton pump inhibitor for your acid reflux, then you've got to be doing all the other things that I just said, because if you're doing all the other things that I just said, maybe you can wean yourself off the proton pump inhibitor if your doctor's happy for you to do so, which on balance is probably a good thing to do. Great, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, yeah, that's helpful. Well, folks, the plant-based diet revolution, all the information that you got from this one podcast, and it was chock full of information. You'll get even more from the plant-based diet revolution book that Dr. Alan Desmond wrote. So please go get it. Uh, it's got more of his wisdom in there. So thank you so much for being on our show. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks guys. It's lovely to hang out with you. I really enjoyed it. If we were in person, guys, I would get a photograph right now. So I'm going to get a photo right now. That's okay. okay. Or if, if, if you want to wave, I want to call tonight. So, I mean, do you, if we get interrupted, which is unlikely, but could happen, is that okay? Can I pause yeah. and come back and you can edit? Yeah, out we better. edit. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, so. Don't just, let anybody this is... die on the switch for good luck. Yeah, okay. Good call. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org and include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.